You guys asked for it and I am giving it to you. The number one request on the YouTube channel for the past 12 months has been to get Mike Isretel to sit down for a conversation. So him and I did that a little while back and now it is here for you. If you'd like to support the channel, check out LHBK merch. It's down in the YouTube shop and on LHBK.shop. Become a part of a growing, welcoming community for strength sports, for bodybuilding, for training. Lift heavy, be kind, and enjoy the video. So we are at the Arnold's. I compete this afternoon and I thought, I have to bite the bullet, get my kids to tell over and have a conversation with the doctor. And what we're going to talk about today is the difference between training for building size and training for building strength, which there's, of course, a lot of similarities, particularly if you're early on in your training. But the number one thing that I get when I tell people I'm world's strongest man is that, oh, but my cousin's bigger than you or my I saw this guy who's way more jacked than you. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for joining. Dude, thank you um, for having me. And I would love just let's cover first the the most important principles when it gets to training for size. Yes. So first of all, just to say something very clearly, the cousin thing, they're just lying. <laughs> or they just have a misunderstanding of how jacked you really are. Their yeah. cousin's like 220. <laughs> The last time they remember seeing him, they were nine years old. He was, he was the biggest person yeah. I've ever seen in my life. Um, so the critical elements of training for size is, depending on how simple we want to make it, is challenging your body with quote-unquote heavy resistance. I'll define that later. Yep. Um, weights, which when you lift, they start slowing down on you. Hard training. And then obviously, you can't really talk about gaining size without uh, concern for nutrition because fueling the body and putting in enough literal raw materials is how you end up getting jacked. So there's lots of people in the IPF, for example, that are, you know, 120 pounds and they lift more than me, yeah. but how come they're not so jacked? Something about a drug test, I'm not interested in that kind of noise. <laughs> but um, it really does come down to the food because if you weigh 120 pounds, you could be strong as shit, but if you, if you don't eat your way up to 180 or whatever, it doesn't matter how strong you get, you're just never gonna be ultra jacked. Yeah. So there's nutrition and there's a training component and the training component is a train heavy, right? But in hypertrophy training, technically speaking, anything between doing one rep that's tough yep. or close to your one RM, all the way up to doing even sets of like 50 reps close to failure works pretty well. Is that right? Yeah, for wow. sure. For sure. Wow. It put you on a leg press and do 50 reps to failure. Like you're going to get <laughs> sore. Shit's going to happen. You'll get a pump, blah, blah, blah. The strongman in me is like, why would you do 50 when you could do one? <laughs> Well, what do you? What happens when you do the truck pull, motherfucker? I know it's horrible. You're like, yeah, yeah. I, just I, one step. I'm like, forced yeah, yeah, sure. to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm strapped in. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> so uh, basically, the most productive, seemingly rep range for uh, muscle growth training is something like five reps, challenging, where it gets close to failure, all the way to sets of thirty repetitions. Wow. If you train roughly that heavy, you're going to get seemingly, at least in the short term studies we have, like roughly equivalent results. What does that mean? That means you take a group of people and you train them mostly sets of five, which is how you, period, this is how you train for strength. I'm kidding. <laughs> Not entirely. Yeah, of course. Mr. Ripto, I'm sure, no doubt, is watching this <laughs> as he sees all. And um, then you have someone training for sets of 25, close to failure. Yeah. It's just not wise to bet your money out. One of them is going to get more jacked than the other, one group than the other. They get right. roughly the same level of jack. We have direct studies on this. It's yeah. a little bit surprising yeah. to people, but it's not so surprising. There's a bunch of bodybuilders always talk about like the burn and the pump etching in the fucking detail with the high reps. And it turns out they were onto some shit. Like, okay. Not a lot, but sets of 20 to 30 actually do promote very robust gains in muscle size, but they might not promote a ton of what we normally call strength. So Okay. Interesting, because when you see bodybuilders across the board, something I've never really understood is you have guys who swear by low, heavy, low rep heavy training, and you have other guys who are just after maximal volume mm -hmm. and they do see you have both of them on the olympia stage obviously smashing it so there's really no real distinction in five or so you don't get a different muscle hardness or anything like that maybe not obvious enough for us to detect in the scientific literature yeah and not obvious enough uh for us as coaches and observers and participants in strength sports to really be able to point it out so for example you say you walk into like a, well, fuck it, walk somewhere in the Arnold with some, like one of your buddies. Let's yeah. say a person who doesn't lift. Yeah. Um, you really start to find out what it is you know or don't know about your sport when you talk to someone who doesn't lift. You try <laughs> right. to explain shit to them and they're like, that doesn't make sense. You're like, fuck, you're right, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I don't know this. So, yeah. If you can point out a dude to me and be like, that guy for sure trains the sets of 20 to 30, yeah. put another dude that says that guy for sure trains the sets of five to eight, 
dude, I'd be fucking super impressed if you could reliably hit it. Yeah. Which you both, we both know you probably can't because I fucking can't because who the fuck can? Of course. So it turns out that whatever's happening with sets of five to eight, roughly, or sets of 20 to 25 to 30, roughly, it seems that it is not an easy way to pick the two out unless you bring both guys into the gym and put the 10 RM on the bar and then see who gets what reps. Then you start to figure some shit out. Okay, cool. Now, the way that I've always thought of building muscle, and we'll get to, to build to training for your strength in a second, but the way I've always thought of building muscle is you almost have different models by which you can do that. You could have heavier lower rep training and work on heavy mechanical tension, which you'll have a natural adaptation process to. You'll have some level of a hormone spike after that training. If you go to 30 reps and it's relatively lighter, well, you have a metabolic stress response, mm -hmm. and that would be a primary driver of muscle growth, and both of those are pretty good. Mm -hmm. Is that an accurate way at a broad level to describe? Um, it's not bad at all. We're not 100% sure anywhere close to that of how much anabolic drive metabolic stress actually brings there have been at least two metabolites phosphatidic acid and lactate that have been tested directly in animal models yeah and if you actually literally inject them into the cell they do cause hypertrophy to occur okay so that's pretty dope yeah. but we don't have really good human data on like is it really the metabolites in real life causing that hypertrophy response versus tension there's another thing sets of 20 to 30 if you look at total amount of tension introduced to the muscle over time, mm -hmm. let's say you do sets of five, hard, heavy. Yeah. Each rep is a fuckload of tension through that muscle and yeah. all the tension detectors in your muscle, of which there are, last I checked, at least like five different kinds, yeah. probably subtypes too, they detect tension. Like, holy fuck, grow. Yeah. If you, you're sort of yelling each time, it's like tension, 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 five times. It gets the message across and they grow. If you have sets of 25 reps, each time you speak tension, it, it's not as much. So it's like tension, tension, tension. <laughs> right. But 25 times, like if someone's trying to wake you up and say, wake up, wake up, wake up, 25 times, you're like, yeah, what the fuck, I'm up, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's still mechanical tension that's responsible for some or most of the growth for both of them. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit more mechanical tension for the sets of five, a little bit less total mechanical tension for the sets of 20 to 30, but that metabolite stuff makes up the difference and brings them roughly equal. Yeah. So even on just mechanical tension alone, there's two ways to get to a lot of tension messaging to the muscle. One is very few reps to really drive a hard message, and the other is many reps to drive a softer message, but they kind of add up. Wow, okay. Does that and make then, sense? Yeah, and then when you're prescribing that to someone, presumably, let's say it's not an IFBB pro, it's someone who's just looking to put on muscle. I only, bro, I just... only deal with IFB pros, man. I don't want to you know say I don't need to spare channel. <laughs> Damn. But let's, really, then it gets down to psychology. And what do you prefer to do more? What, what's going to get you in the gym more? Is that fair enough? That's a huge part of it. Yeah. Another part of it is <clears throat> exercise specific. If I say, dude, you're doing sets of five on the high bar squat, you're going to be like, dope, that sounds fun. Yeah. If I say you're doing sets of 30 in the high bar squat, you're going to be like, I think that's just cardio at that point. It literally yeah. is. Like your quads won't give out. Your lungs will give out. Yeah. Your lower back will give out. Yeah. You just won't be able to stand upright anymore. Another thing is like uh, lateral raises. Mm -hmm. I say lateral raises, sets of 20. You're like, that sucks. But here we go. Yeah. Lateral raises for sets of five. You're like, did the, the, the shoulder Strange. Yeah. <laughs> get hurt that way? Maybe no. Yeah. It flies for sets of five. That's fucking weird, right? Of course. So some exercises are just more conducive for a variety of reasons to being okay. higher repetition exercise, lower ones. Yeah. Another one is injury risk. So it's just a categorically true statement that the absolutely heavier a weight gets, like, I mean, just like kilos on the bar, yep. the more injury risk it has to you. I mean, if you run into a person on the street, you're probably not going to get hurt. You run into a car at the same speed, you might get hurt. Big weights can hurt you yep. more than small weights can injury wise. So if you are competing in the world's strongest man or something like that, something you know a little bit about, yep. um, you, you, you got to go heavy. There's just no alternative yep. to the weights are going to be heavy at the competition. Yep. But if you're a bodybuilder, you got to really think shit through. Mm. Off season, you love heavy training spiritually. It seems to fucking work for you. Hey, fucking God bless you. Sets of five to 10 all the way. Yeah. Pre-contest, you got a little anti-estrogen in the mix. Got a little halo in the mix. Yeah. Got a little all kinds of bullshit. You're at whatever question mark percent body fat. Yeah. Your grandma cries when she sees your face. Yeah. Thinks you're starving. <laughs> Maybe sets of five to 10 aren't ideal anymore. Maybe the injury probability is a little higher than you're comfortable with, especially given those circumstances. Yeah. So it might be a good idea to have higher rep range just safe for times where you don't want to super get hurt. Here's another one. Yeah. After, if I don't know if you guys have a season in Strongman. You have many seasons for yeah. many, many preps, right? <clears throat> a couple weeks after that big prep where you won world's strongest man or whatever 
you might want to go lighter for a few weeks yeah. to regrow some lost muscle from that peaking process because yeah. I imagine training volumes aren't super high coming in. You got yeah. to drop fatigue. Yeah. And then you also want to like get you know your jackness back, but also just train normally with like maybe sets of three. You're like, dude, I fucking did some shit. You yeah. know, like stones. Like, yeah. You ever done stones and not a little bit hurt something? <laughs> no. That's yes. strong, man, of right? Of course. So you might want to go to higher reps after that point just to kind of fucking still have the muscle back but relieve all that joint connective tissue stress. Yeah. So that's a big concern with training heavy, which is why when guys say it's all preference, I'm like, preference is a big deal. But like when you get seriously into athletics, strong man, bodybuilding, whatever, you kind of have to kind of choose your phases and choose them. That's cool. Because it's funny, if you would just have this conversation with someone who knew nothing, and you talk about the, the primary driver of muscle growth is going to be working against he relatively heavy load against resistance that's going to slow you down. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds exactly the same as strength sports, mm -hmm. but it's it's nuanced. So let's talk, I think, similarities first. First of all, we when we're training hard and into season, we need to be, of course, working against resistance that's going to slow us down. Mm -hmm. uh, but the difference being that we now have a skill component to it. Mm -hmm. I think people would be really surprised that there would be professional bodybuilders and people who look incredible who just don't deadlift. Back to your risk reward thing, they just say, this isn't something that I do and it's not required. Mm -hmm. But in the same breath, I went from 230 pounds running marathons to 325 pounds world's strongest man. And during that time, I had very few phases where I was up in the 20 to 30 range. Of course, there's a lot of components to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we get to what we actually consider when we're training. And I think sometimes you can look at people in the gym and it could look identical. Bodybuilder doing heavier off-season training, strongman in-season training. But bodybuilders are just thinking about muscle and growing muscle and aesthetics. Where we're, muscle is actually not a consideration unless you're in off-season. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about the skill and we talk about our tendons. And our tendons and our soft tissues are actually more of a consideration full stop than muscle. Because the way that, that we think of it is that when you train heavy into competition, naturally with lower blood supply, your soft tissues aren't going to have the same ability to adapt as muscle, especially if you're doing things to get super physiologically strong. Nonsense. <laughs> then we have the capacity to rip them off the bone. And so that lighter training for us is twofold. One, it's going to allow the tendons to grow thicker and stiffer. And two, it's going to allow us a, a time period for our nervous system to calm down, which is a whole nother can of worms that we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. When you get to bodybuilding style training, do you see the same level of burnout as you might in strength sports, i.e. we go maybe six weeks and then we need a week of chilling out. Is that the same in bodybuilding if you're doing higher reps? I say if you're training properly, it is. Um, yeah. You're training the most properly you can and really putting in a full send approach to bodybuilding. Yeah, hell yeah. Okay. I need to deload every four weeks or five weeks. Um, right. If I do every six weeks, I have to take like a half week deload somewhere between there. And most of the folks I associate myself with, every four to six weeks they deload. Most bodybuilders, maybe not most, many, right. they don't train with a high enough volume per week. They're not close enough to their maximum recoverable volume to really challenge the physiology as much, yeah. accumulate as much fatigue, and thus they can go for weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks without deloading. Now, there's a bit of a trick to that because some of them will be like, yeah, man, it's not feeling it today. Gonna take a couple rest days. We spend time with the wife, you know, like deciphering periodization from Instagram posts. Yeah. But um, turns out his like, you know, trend shipment just didn't come in or whatever. It's, <laughs> can't start the last phase. But um, there's definitely people do auto-regulated rest. Yeah. But the beating down on the connective tissues between strongman and between bodybuilding is in a totally different category. Yeah. Um, and then so even if you do sets of five to ten, that's often in the machines or in compound movements that are very well controlled. Yeah especially if your technique is pretty good. It doesn't really fuck up your connective tissues a ton. Uh, also, a lot of the guys will never be tested in limit strength. So they can an Olympia prep and their joints and connective tissues are like a little frayed, a little fucked up. Yeah. They don't really care because in the last couple of weeks they drop the loads anyway. Yeah. And then they just do this. And it's just it's not that hard, yeah. right? Um, you guys have a se separate concern of not only do you need to make sure you get your strongest ever before you start the tapering process, huh. but you need to make sure your joints and connective tissues are also damn near the healthiest they've ever been. Yeah. You do not want to go into the fucking tire flip doing this. You yeah. ever see guys do this yeah. before the tire flip? Well, that guy's not going to win. Yeah. He's like, I don't know about all this bullshit. Yeah. So uh, it's bodybuilders can both oftentimes don't push it as hard as you guys do. Yeah. Um, and when they do, they can get away with more. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of like 
being fucked up that you can just uh, take because you're never pushed to your limits. Yeah. Like if my knees kind of feel weird before hack squats, eh, I'm probably not going to rip the shit off the bone. Yeah. But if I'm trying to do a fucking, you know, uh, one of those fucking runs with refrigerators or some shit, <laughs> you better be feeling pretty <laughs> goddamn pretty good. good. So, yeah. 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 That's cool. Now, something that people tend not to understand very well, layperson, uh, when I, and I, we're taking a break from your exclusive IFBB Pro coverage, but the layperson, when I talk about I'm going into competition, bodybuilding being a relatively more popular sport than strongman, they're like, oh, yeah, you're, you're looking more cut. And you're looking, <laughs> that's not really the case. It's funny how. Oh, geez, they're ready to say that? Yeah. Yeah. To you. Yeah. That's amazing. They don't, like, no concept. You should lean into it. Be like, you don't, you don't think my forearms are ready? They're like, I guess they look good. <laughs> Uh, but let's talk about how we have to flip it on its head in terms of what people would traditionally think of prep for bodybuilders. Of course, for strongmen, mass moves mass. We actually get fatter into shows. We get larger into shows. The whole entire goal is around just the performance variable, which a bodybuilder would be their absolute weakest when they get to the stage. But like you said, they're going to be relatively strong when they get to off season and probably want to do a little bit heavier load. Sure, sure. It's a very, very different approach. At the end of the day, the training process for bodybuilding is a performance thing. It's a performance sport. The more you can stack up more five pounds plates at the end of your leg press over the course of a whole cycle, the bigger your quads will look. Yeah. No one's going to debate that shit. Uh -huh. The more reps you can add, the better. But when it comes down to do the peaking, you don't really, you perform in a technical sense on a bodybuilding stage. But like, it's not what we in sports sports science call like a limit performance. Yeah. You know, no one ever finishes their posing routine. They're like, oh, yeah. oh, they're like, paramedics take them off. Well, maybe for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> not because the posing was yeah. hard. Yeah. So it just it's just more performative. It's just a matter of showing people what you got. Of course. But for a uh, strongman sport, you you really really uh, that you don't take it easy until that last giant, whatever. Thomas Inch dumbbell or whatever fucking yeah, hits yeah. the ground. <laughs> and so you're concerned with both your performance during the approach, um, your cardiorespiratory fitness during the approach, because it's dope to get fucking huge, huge. Yeah. But then someone's like, okay, there's a couple cardio-ish events, and you're like, yeah. that sucks. Yeah. So you're playing this crazy balance, and you have to be your strongest ever on that day. Um, peaking for strongmen and the amount of psychology and physiology that goes into it it just pushes the body really, really, really far. Yeah. There's another concern there, too. When bodybuilders look their best, their degree of fatigue is usually quite low, which means the last several weeks of bodybuilding training and prep shouldn't even be that hard. You should kind of be coasting in. Oh, that right. Point. If you do your homework, you got to get in shape a little bit before and then coast in, you look your best. Okay. In strongman, that's a similar thing, yeah. but the peaking process looks considerably different, where you do want to take some load off and be easy but you're not just like ah the rest is just me doing this yeah. you're like I, I had to really perform in three days or whatever yes. yeah. so huge differences bodybuilders have a lot more wiggle room also for example if i have hack squats in the program mm -hmm. but like if my knees are feeling weird or my back's feeling weird sub out leg press no problem you know, all the sports scientists in the world stand there and be like, is that okay, fellas? Be like, yeah, it's totally fine. Yeah. You want general hypertrophy. No judge is like grading your legs on stage and he's like, that uh, I can, that, he switched <laughs> to the leg press, no way. Yeah. But, you know, you got an axle press coming out, world's strongest man. Yeah. You better be training with that fucking implement. Yes. And if you're like, oh, my shoulder feels weird, I don't know what your training partners are going to tell you. They're yeah. going to be like, uh, <laughs> do you want like a light session and then come back Thursday to do this shit? Yeah. You got to still do the shit. Yeah. That's an extra constraint that makes strongman training a bit of a different animal. Now, one thing that's always fascinated me, and you're actually the perfect person to talk to this about. I'm, I go to a gym with heaps of bodybuilders. Oh, no And way. some of them, like, it's more a bodybuilding gym than a strongman gym. I'm sort of the only strongman there. Okay. But these guys, it, it, it just baffles me that they don't really track their loads over time. Of course, when we're doing strongman prep, I know the axle is 182 kilos. Four weeks out, I'm going to do 155, 65, 70, 75. You got very precise, and of mm -hmm. course total volume and tension and tracking that over time would be useful of course you have the confounding variable of as you get leaner you will get weaker so what's the actual proper method of tracking your loads over time like is progressive overload the, the basis of that uh, a core principle in a bodybuilding prep yeah you can get so those are very good points 
you can generate progressive overload with zero tracking. You just have to make sure to bring roughly your A game every time. So that's how this works. You bring your A game, you train really fucking hard. You rest, recover, the muscle recovers, it gets a little bigger, a little stronger. You come in next time, and remember, your rule is you bring roughly your A game every time. You automatically are expected to hit a mini PR the next time you come in. Yeah. You didn't track dick, yeah. but you always push it hard. Push it hard last week for you was 200 kilos on a leg press for 15. This week it's 205. Fuck it, you didn't track numbers, you don't even put 205 on the shit. Yeah. You just put 200 because it's fucking 100, 100, and you're good, yeah. like 440, whatever. Yeah. You automatically get one or two extra reps because you're more used to it because you're stronger. So if as a bodybuilder you track nothing, but you bring your A game roughly every single time you come into the gym, yeah. and you can really feel when it's not your A game, so it's time for a deload or a couple of easy days, you your body does all the work underneath, and it just continues to get better. Like if you download all the updates for your Windows on your computer or whatever, yeah. your computer will work better. Yeah. You don't have to benchmark your computer. Be like, you didn't even benchmark it, download the fucking tool to see how fast the <laughs> processor. You're like, I, I just assume that's happening. It's the same way in the body. Right. You will get more jacked and more strong just by pushing it, resting, pushing it, resting, pushing it, resting. Yeah. So this is 90% of the work right there. Mm -hmm. And since most bodybuilders, the way they get to be their best is they hit roughly A minuses on most categories of prep, food and drugs and blah, 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 and training, yeah. they can get away with that, no problem. Sure. But to your point, an A plus effort looks like tracking everything. Yeah, okay. Even in bodybuilding. When uh, I talk to strongmen, I talk to weightlifters, powerlifters, I talk about periodization, they're all like, uh -huh. <laughs> when I talk to bodybuilders, like, man, fuck that shit, periodization is that word that starts with a G we used to say in the 90s all the time. You can't say anymore. <laughs> so like, is that right? No, yeah. Periodization in general is not super commonplace in bodybuilding. No. That's two, wow. two, uh, two parts to that. Wow. One, you can get really great results without it. Yeah. Uh, not your best results. Of course. But remember, like, you don't know if you're getting your best results. You yeah. just have a fucking six pack and you weigh 280 and that's it. Of course. So there's that whole culture there. And a, a lot of people in bodybuilding are just not uh, super interested in being overly intellectual about it. It's like a passion thing for them. Yeah. They want to go in the gym and fucking just do this shit. Yeah. And I think, like, that's how Strongman starts. Yep. You want to go and fucking pick up heavy shit. 100%. But then you get to Worlds and you're like, oh, there's 10 people here that are better at this than I am. What do they all do? Well, they all track their shit. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I gotta start tracking my shit. I can't just do random shit. I'm sure you've seen towns of young guys just kind of get really strong, yeah. doing pretty random shit. But then they're like, "Hey, how do I get to the next level?" You're like, "Well, we see a training notebook," and they're like, "Yeah, hundred percent." Anyway, that's that's so funny because obviously bodybuilders have nutrition figured out eons ahead of strength athletes, mostly because we've got to leave us the fuck alone. We like our food, sure, but it's like the most basic training principles aren't absorbed by the bodybuilding community as a whole. We all learn from each other. Yeah. It just takes time. Yeah. And one thing that people, this is a huge fallacy, is people assume that today's champions know the most that can be known, not just the most today. Yes. Most of today's champions are roughly the, the, the people that know the best what works for them, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But in 20 years, we might look back at today's champions and be like, they knew a lot of good shit, that they were missing some pieces. Yes. For example, I always bring this up, it's always true, in the 1960s, the average offensive lineman in the NFL weighed 225 pounds. Yeah. Now, that was back when weightlifting was um, decried by many as something that slows you down and makes you unathletic. Yeah. Imagine putting a fucking all-pro lineman from, like, 2018 <laughs> up against those people. He's just stiff-arm the quarterback. The guy's dead. You're like, what the fuck? He's dead. Yeah. It was just, it's no contest. Yeah. Because now we know listening to the current best is sweet, but we might know some shit that's better. So in the future of strongman sport... More guys than average are probably going to pay attention to better technique like they have been and nutrition. One of the people that, for me, at least culturally, I actually would love to ask you this question. In the strongman culture, it seems to me that Brian Shaw himself brought a higher level of professionalism to the sport because Brian seemed to care about all the things. Oh my like, God. he, Brian Shaw, at 440 pounds, you would think, like, he just eats fucking whatever. Yeah. Most of the time, he's on a strict diet. Yeah. Now, it's a strict diet of 12,000 fucking calories, <laughs> but nonetheless, he has to do it. It's not optional. Yeah. To cover off the Brian Shaw thing, in my life, I've never seen anyone more meticulous yeah. A to Z yeah. on everything. And for me, I won't do that because psychologically it, it harms me. Where, like, if I was so particular, we wouldn't have this conversation right now, and I'd be super stressed about the countless this right. weekend. 
I just got to get right what I got to get right. Uh, but stone loading. That's a great. Think, that's a great mindset, by the way. Yeah. You're considering your psychological fatigue. Yes. And you're saying anything that I do has to be two things: one, effective mm -hmm. on its own merits, and two, not excessively fatiguing to me psychologically, so that I'm fucking worried about it all the goddamn yes. time. If you're always super overly psychotic, you're just gonna burn out sooner or later. Well, that's the only difference for us as well between this show we have this weekend. It's max deadlift, which you'll have done that in training for the most part. It's a frame carry, which if you're good at it, it'll take eight seconds. If you're bad at it, don't bother. <laughs> yeah, but if you don't even move it, then it's an Jeez, isometric. It's so crazy. It's crazy. Then we've got uh, Denny Stones, which is just going to kill your thumbs, but not hugely taxing otherwise. Mm -hmm. We've got an axle clean and press, which will be tiring, not the end of the world. And then a Stone Series. Point being, all of that stuff over two days of training is really normal. But I think guys get their, themselves totally run into the ground because your arousal states at a 10 for 48 yes. hours and then you're fucked. It's hugely fucked. Well, fucked before you even do your last event. That's a real fucking problem. Who gives a 100%. shit what you're like after the show? Yeah. You get into the stones and you're just like cooked. Yeah. I've done that in powerlifting. After squat and bench, because I'm getting up for both of them, yeah. deadlifts show up and I'm like, uh, it's like Dragon Ball Z. I can't power up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a really good place to leave it. Thank you very much for that. I think it's, uh, yeah, the commonalities should be more than they are because I think the training principles, the nutrition, the crossover should be massive. Uh, and I think over time, the sports will sort of start to merge together where you'll get these leaner, strong men and you'll get these stronger bodybuilders. Um, and um, yeah, but thank you very much for coming on. Hope Huge pleasure. Loved it. Best of luck to you in the competition. Cheers, dude. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. Pop in the comments, who would you like me to collab with next? Hope you enjoyed, as per usual. Lift heavy, be kind, and we'll catch you next time.